Now let's stand and read the 17th chapter of John. Mm. Glorious, glorious chapter. Get to hear the prayers of Jesus. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may also glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have been kept by your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of this world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself, and they may also be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but for also those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them, you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you had given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. Father, we do pray that we can come to realize this prayer, that we are kept by your so well kept, that we are sanctified, Lord, and that we are one, one with you and the Father and one with another. And Lord, that one day, one day, and it may be very soon, this prayer will be realized for the ingathering of your people, the harvest that will come, Lord, of souls. Not just those who will come to faith, Lord, but one day soon, you're coming to take us off of this earth. But until you do, help us to be faithful to the calling with which you have called us that we walk worthy of that calling, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. 
So here Jesus makes it clear he's not just praying for his disciples, but he's praying for all of those who would believe through their word. The last thing he said to them before he ascended up into heaven, he said, go into all the earth and do what? Make disciples. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And so they did. They were opening up through the power of the Holy Spirit, the world to the truth of the gospel. And we are the children of the apostles, the four legs upon which the church rests, right? In Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 44, to remain steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. That's what's been shared to us. That's what we keep. If you're going to be orthodox, if you're going to maintain and embrace orthodoxy, it would be the teachings of the apostles. Now, there's many apostates today in our day. There's a lot of teaching that's going on, even this morning, that is apostate. It's not orthodox. It's very unorthodox. And unfortunately, too many don't even realize they're sitting under what is not the truth, but it's heresy. But we know that Jesus' prayer has been realized and will be realized when his church was birthed there at Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit had come upon the church and the apostles were equipped for the ministry that God had called them to, they shared the truth with the world, and the world has been turned right side up ever since, hasn't it? And it's amazing the multitude, the myriad of believers who have come about in the last 2,000 years. Can you imagine how large our family really is? One day when we get to heaven, we'll be able to see and spend eternity getting to know all of our family members. Wouldn't that be wonderful? It's a joy to do it here now, isn't it? Yeah. And so Jesus makes it very clear. He says in verse 20, I do not pray for these alone, not just for the disciples he was talking to then, but also for those who would believe through their word. Faith comes by and hearing by? Yeah, it's not man's speculation. It's not with somebody all of a sudden gets some epinosis and is speaking uh, ex cathedra, right? That was uh, the Catholic Church and the Pope would change so much of the truth of the scriptures, unfortunately. And there are those in the hyper-Pentecostal movement today who believe that, that they'll receive the rhema rather than the logos, the word of God. They receive a rhema, a revelation of God's word, which could be contrary to the word of God. But you're to believe that because they received it so supposedly from God. Epinosis from above. No, 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 no. Faith comes by the word of God. We don't worship the word, do we? But we worship the God who's represented through his word. And it's not man's speculation, but it's God's revelation that we want to hold dear and hold on to. That's what our brothers and sisters are holding on to in the Ukraine. That's what our brothers and sisters have held on to through all of the suffering of the church, throughout all of the ages, staying true to the word of God. So he says here, yes, those who would believe in your word through them, that they may all be one as we, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe you sent me. How is the world going to know that Jesus was sent and that, we, that what he, we believe about him and everything that he taught us is in fact true through the unity that we would have? Uniformity? Conformity? Sameness? No, 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 no. What is he talking about? Unity of the Spirit. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4 for a moment. Ephesians chapter 4. Chapter 4 of Ephesians, verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Are you? Paul is saying here, he begs you to. It's the only sane thing for you to do if you really recognize who you are in Christ Jesus. Have a walk worthy of the calling for which you were called, with all lowliness, humility, and gentleness, meekness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep what? The unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now, that's not uniformity. It's not sameness. And, and, and listen, we're not creating unity. Can I create unity? No, no, I can't hold you together. You can't hold me together. But the unity that we have to maintain is simply what has been given to us by the Holy Spirit. How many of you have gone on foreign missions trips? How many of you have gone to any a foreign land? And you recognize that they're very, very different than you and I, aren't they? Yeah, uh, how often I've been in another country, don't even speak the same language, but I'll be in a church somewhere and recognize immediately there's a oneness that I have 
with these people. They're my brothers and sisters. And, and there's a love and an appreciation, a compassion, a connection that we have. And everything else, we're so different from one another. Our cultures, our belief, our desires, you know, our language, education, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But but in the spirit of God, there is oneness, unity. Now, he's not talking about an institutional unity, is he? What, what, what happens when there's an institutional unity, when there's a worldwide church? Have we ever had that where there was a worldwide church? In Romanism. That began, it began with Constantine, when Constantine determined that Christianity would be the religion of the state, and then overnight, all of these pagan priests and priestesses became Christians. Christian priests and priestesses. So much of the corruption that occurred within the church, so much of the paganism that crept into the church crept in at that time. And then as the Church of Rome, now the, the book of Romans was written to the very church that became so corrupt, but had controlled all of the known world, all of Europe at that time, and they were power-hungry political operatives. That's all they were, weren't they? Yeah. So we see that when there is an institutional church, a one church, then absolute power corrupts absolutely. And it became very, very, very corrupt, didn't it? Now, uh, briefly, let me warn you. This, this whole move to retake America, or reawaken America. Um, I forgot the phrase that they use. What did they, somebody remind me. Awaking America, whatever it might be. A reawakening. A lot of these nationalists, they're not Christian as you understand Christianity, biblical Christianity. And, and they're even espousing that we need one church. One religion is what they say. They don't say church. They say we need one religion. What does that sound like to you? The New World Order. The one religious movement. We know that the Bible predicts that there's coming a time, very soon, where there'll be a one world economy, a one world governmental system, a one world health system, and a one world religious system. And that religious system will be controlled, controlled by whom? Well, it's Satan <laughs> and the Antichrist and the false prophet. And that's what unity institutionally will bring about, such a tyranny that you and I could never imagine. The unity he's talking about is a unity of the spirit, and it's demonstrated, it's manifest. How is that unity manifest? In love, love. For the law of the spirit is, the chief attribute of our God is love. And so we need to forbear with one another, forgiving one another, be kindly hearted one to another. All of those one another commands that are given in the New Testament are fulfilled in this communion, in, this, in the church, as a family. Yes, yes, yes. Go with me to Ephesians again. Did we go there? Hmm. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with the mother in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. For there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in y'all. He was Southern Baptist. <laughs> no? Now, this unity has already been developed. It's a unity of the Spirit. Oh, how good and pleasant it is. What? When brethren gather together in unity. The unity that doesn't need to be created. The unity that exists in the Spirit. As we are of one mind, one heart, one purpose, one will. And that's all the mind of God, the purposes of God, the will of God through the Word of God. It's got to be maintained. How do you maintain it? You maintain it through the four aspects that the church stands upon, remaining steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. Secondly, prayer. Praying always for all men, remaining steadfast in doctrine and in prayer. Thirdly, communion. Regularly, we have communion. This Wednesday is communion. John Michael's ad admonition is absolutely correct. Don't prepare on Wednesday. Start preparing even now this afternoon. Begin to ask the Holy Spirit. Say, Lord, what is it in my life right now that I find acceptable that you find detestable? 
I guarantee you, if you will honestly, sincerely ask the Lord that question, he's going to show you. Now, what are you going to do about it? You're going to surrender it? I was a slave to sin. You were slaves to sin. Our independence came through the person of the Holy Spirit. I'm no longer enslaved by my desire for alcohol or drugs or inappropriate sexual activity or the lust of my flesh and materialism. I've been set free from all of that. Why? Because I've been given the mind of Christ and the heart of God. And as I stay in fellowship and in prayer and in the breaking of bread, and in the apostles' doctrine, I am kept free from all of that. I'm not tempted by it any longer, you see. But we need to stay in the communion as well as we come together. Now, we're all going to make mistakes. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Is that a perfection of performance? Can you do that? No, no. What is it? It's a perfection of relationship. Do you truly love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Do you? Or have you made other pursuits, desires, treasures your idol? You know. Well, we need to constantly do a self-examination of our hearts to see, do we truly love God as we say we do? Mm. For too many people, we could say, well, you know, I guess you do love God, but it appears from your actions and from your desires, you love yourself more. You have to ask yourself that question. So before you come Wednesday and take communion, be honest with yourself, be honest to God, and say, Lord, show me. Show me those things in my life that I found acceptable, that I've compromised with, Lord, that, that shouldn't be there at all. And Lord, I know you desire to set me free. For your spirit will set me free if I'm willing. Remember Jesus going to the Pool of Siloam. And the man was, was a crippled since birth. And he said, would you like to be healed? Now, what kind of a question was that? It was a very honest one. Because a lot of people like being a victim. A lot of people like wallowing in whatever it is that's mastering them. Alcohol, inappropriate uh, sexual relationships, materialism, drugs, whatever it might be. Do you want to be set free from that? Or do you still want to be in bondage? Is that your precious, you know, <laughs> precious? No, but if you're honest to God and you want to give it up and you've had enough of it and it makes you nauseous, then God will free you. I guarantee you, I've, I've experienced it time and time and time again in my life. I could say, based upon everything I know about you all, I'm the chief of sinners. I know what I've done. But Jesus has set me free. My emancipation, my liberation came, but I had to surrender it to him first, you see. We don't take an offering here, do we? We've never taken an offering in all of our existence. No chicken buckets. Why don't we take an offering? God doesn't take, you. God doesn't take anything from you. He receives what you offer him. Now, if you want to, you want to offer him, that area of your weakness, whatever it might be. I had to offer him my addiction to nicotine. And he took it away. I quit a thousand times before he actually took it away. Why? Because I enjoyed it too much, and I didn't really want to quit. But when I came to that place where I despised it, and it was hurting the temple that he had given me, he freed me. 1985. Five years into my Christianity, I said, God, I, I don't want to be like the rest of my family. I don't want to be bound by alcohol. I don't want to find my joy, my merriment, my comfort in a bottle. <clears throat> Help me, Lord. I'm tired of it. You've set me free. And one bondage after another, after another, one chain after another, after another, after another, he is broken and is breaking in my life, and I'm just so thankful. But how does it happen? We first need to be honest with ourselves, honest to God, and offer it to him. And I absolutely guarantee you, he will take it. And you'll be set free. Whom the Son sets free shall be free indeed. My truth will set you free. My word is truth. So this unity is unity of the Spirit, unity in love, the love of God. Anybody here get saved during the Jesus movement? I did. Anybody else? Yeah. 
You, you know, one thing that, that struck me, I mean, I was not comfortable with Christians and their Christianese, and I wasn't comfortable going to church. I went to a Catholic church as a boy, uh, didn't go to church regularly until, uh, gosh, from, uh, I probably stopped going to the Catholic church at about 12, never went back to church until I was in my 20s. And so it was a very foreign culture, and they spoke a foreign language. They were just foreign people to me. But one thing I can remember, the first time I experienced a gathering of Jesus people was the love. The love that was, it was thick in the room. You could, you could feel the love of God. One of the principal men that God used during that time was a fellow by the name of Chuck Smith. And Chuck Smith was not a charismatic in any way. If you ever listen to Chuck Smith preach, he's a heavy set, bald headed man just stood at the pulpit with his hands on the pulpit like somebody's going to pry him away you know <laughs> and then he was very monotone in his delivery but there was a power of God's love and the Holy Spirit that radiated, that was transmitted that was transferred through that man like none other and, and others like him, Billy Graham is another example but what struck me and what caused me to surrender my life and to yield to God was the overwhelming experience and presence of his unconditional, sacrificial love for me just as I am. Isn't that amazing? Now, now listen to me now. If you're a believer and you have the Holy Spirit in you, he has given you the capacity to love the unlovable in that supernatural way. Chuck Smith, like many other men and women of God, allowed the Holy Spirit to work through their life in such a way that people would experience a love that didn't make any sense but could be experienced. A love that is inexplicable, the Bible says. A grace that you can't understand or explain. Right? And so that's what he's talking about here. And uh, as we look in, in Ephesians, this unity, there is already one Spirit, one Lord, one baptism, one church, one faith, now, the ecumenical movement that's taking place today is not truly ecumenical in the strictest definition of the term. Ecumenicalism means all of within the denominations of Christendom coming together, but ecumenism today is all faith, whatever it is you believe. All rivers lead to the ocean, all faiths lead to God, is what they say. Is that true? No, of course it's not true. Otherwise, Jesus is a liar, and everything he taught was untrue. There's only but one way. Yes, I do not pray for these alone, back to John 17, but also for those who will believe through their word, and that they may be one as we are one, Father. You are in me, and I in you, and they also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. This unity, this love, will always produce obedience, an understanding of our purpose, and a real pursuit of orthodoxy, doctrine, sound teaching and the glory which you gave me when I, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one how was it that Jesus had the power to go to the cross to offer his life as a sacrifice how was it he had that power through the power of the person of the Holy Spirit the most Christ eccentric book in the Bible what is it Colossians and what's that great mysterion or mystery in Colossians Christ in you, the hope of glory, the Holy Spirit. We're talking about one and the same. As Jesus Christ had the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Father working in his life to surrender his life for love's sake and for everyone else other than himself, so too God has given us the power to live a life that would glorify God now in expressing his truth and his love. And if necessary, sacrificing whatever we must for his purposes. This is what he's talking about here. Do you, do you know that you have the person and the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life to love the unlovable? Yes, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I and them, you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. I, I, I have a hard time with this verse. But it's true, isn't it? Because it's in the Bible. Is it true because it's in the Bible? No. It's in the Bible because it's 
See, that's the difference, okay? It's not true because it's in the Bible. But it's in the Bible. It's God's revelation to us because our Father wanted us to know the truth. And the truth is, He loves you as equally as He loves Jesus. It's hard to believe, isn't it? That the Father loves me as much, as intensely, as devotedly as He loves Jesus? God desires to love you far more than you will ever desire to love him. Do you understand that? And what we need to do is live life in an understanding of that love, be set free by his love. And what will the world understand? By not only our expressions of unity, the love that we have one for another. Hey, I'm going to upset you. You know, since the existence of our chapel family here, we've probably had no less than three splits that have occurred. Very painful. And, and I could tell you, you know, as, I, as I just mentioned the three splits, immediately faces and names come to my mind. It hurts me. It breaks my heart. And so much of it was over nothing, nonsense, in every single case. Just stupid. Just allowing the enemy to stir people up over a nothing burger, right? Is that how we refer to it? And, and then they end up leaving the fellowship of believers and hurting his church. <clears throat> Nothing could be more painful. Listen, we're going to offend one another, but we're a family. You know what I love about my Italian family? When we, when we have an argument or someone offends somebody, you'd think we're going to kill each other. you think any moment the guns and the knives are going to be drawn. You know? And then the next minute, we're all hugging and loving each other. We let it out. OK, we're going to offend one. OK, let's, let's work it out. Work through it. Now, I don't recommend you work through it the way my family does, you know? Yeah. There's a lot of yelling and, <laughs> and shouting. And <laughs> but let's purpose. And in each and every case, you know, when these things began to happen, I'd say, look, well, just come and talk to me. Just come and talk to me. My door is always open. Mm -hmm. Now, I may not agree with you. You may not agree with me. But I, but I want to talk with you. I want to reason with you. And, and if you're right and I'm wrong, I'll admit it. And if you're wrong and I'm right, won't you admit it? But our pride won't let that happen, will it? No, so often it doesn't. It's sad how that happens. Let's, let's maintain that unity. I'm going to offend you, and I want to apologize ahead of time, OK? <laughs> Every one of you out there, if, you, if I haven't offended you yet, you just haven't sat here long enough. It's going to happen. I'm sorry. And if it really bothers you, if you can't sleep at night, then call me up. Let's get together, because I want you to sleep. I want you to be at peace. OK? That's how we maintain this unity and this love that we have. For I understand the love that God has for me is equal to the love he has for Jesus. But I also understand that the love he has for you is the same as the love he has for Jesus. So therefore, what kind of a love should I have towards you? Now, I admit my flesh has a bias, OK? It just does, you know? And, and I love everybody, but there's people I like more because of my fleshly bias. Now, I have to get beyond that. Yes. And so do you. We have to get beyond what we like and no, say, I'm going to love because God loves this person. You know, I was never struck by uh, cardinals, you know, the little red bird, the cardinals. And because of my hearing loss of being in a manufacturing environment for so long, I can't even hear their song. You know, I can't hear a cardinal sing. But my first wife, Roberta, you know, she loved cardinals. So I did everything I could to draw cardinals to the back of the house, you know. Did I love cardinals? No. Could care less, you know. <laughs> the only enjoyment I got was putting out the bird feed, which brought the squirrels, which gave me the opportunity to, you know. <laughs> and the cardinals loved it, you know. <laughs> but why did I love cardinals? Because my wife loved cardinals. Why should we truly purpose to love and forgive and care for one another? Because God loves us. Because you're the object of God's love, and I need to love what God loves. Isn't that right? I need to care for what God cares for. Please understand, when we get to heaven, Ray, can't wait till the end of the month, can you? <laughs> I just want you to understand, Ray, you're going to have to give a stewardship to God on how you treat his daughter, right? Yeah, when I, when I went and visited Gail and her dad before I married her, I told her dad, I said, Joe, 
I understand that I have a huge responsibility because she's not only your daughter, she's God's daughter. And I will give an account one day on how well kept she is, how well I exercise my stewardship over her as her husband. Listen, we as Christians have a responsibility on our stewardship to the body of Christ, to the bride of Christ. Every one of us will answer for our stewardship in the way in which we treated his bride. Do you understand that? So we need a purpose to have love one for another, to be forgiving one another, to be patient with one another. And God has been so patient with me. How can I not be with you? God has been so forgiving of me. How can I not be of you? You know what I'm saying. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be one with me where I may be, where I am, that they, this is verse 24, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Now, not only talking about, you know, in, in uh, last week we talked about how well kept we are by our Father. The purpose of Jesus is not only keeping us, but sanctifying us. He not only wants to sanctify us, he wants to bring us to unity. But he not only wants to bring us to unity, he wants to bring us home. Don't you want to be where he is? The ingathering? Now, you can't go uninvited, right? You've got to wait for your invitation to come. Hmm? But, oh, boy, I can't wait to go home. The ingathering is also called a harvest. And there's going to be a great harvest in the fall of the year. Perhaps this fall. Who knows? You know, some think so. I pray so. Yes, O oh, righteous Father, verse 25, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me. Now, the world would know that, we, that Jesus had been sent by the Father by our unity, but the world will know that Jesus was sent by the Father by our love. Look at how divided the world is today. As I said in my prayer earlier, you know, we need another emancipation. We need another independence of liberation from everything that binds us so, the sin that is so pervasive in our society, and the division it's terrible. Now, we know who causes divisions, right? Satan's attempt is always to divide and conquer, divide and conquer. He wants to divide a husband from his wife. He wants to divide children from their parents. He wants to divide churches. He wants to divide the nation. And he's been so effective in getting our political leaders to stir up that division among us, hasn't he? We need a purpose to be united, to be one in Christ. And to display to the world that Jesus has been sent. Why? By our oneness. Verse 26. I'm going to end here this morning, but I want to pick this up again next week because I really want to develop this a lot more, this last verse. For I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Wednesday night we talked about... Uh, some of the types in the Old Testament of the rapture. And the first one we mentioned was who? Enoch. Enoch. And what does Enoch's name mean? Dedicated. Dedicated. Thank you. Enoch's, Enoch, the oldest man that ever lived was Methuselah, right? He was 969 years old. That's old. I, I don't even want to live to 100. I can't imagine. <laughs> 969. He's the oldest man that ever lived, but he died before his father. Because his father was... Enoch, he was taken. He was no more. Now, here's the point I want to make, and I'll, I'll develop this a lot more next week. Enoch reached the vanishing point in his life. You know the vanishing point? When they don't see you any longer and all they see is Jesus? Hebrews tells us why Enoch was taken. For Enoch walked with God, and then he pleased God he and God were one. He and God were together in union and communion so effectively that Enoch was no more. No more. Now, I understand that the text is saying locationally he wasn't on the earth any longer, that God took him. But I want to suggest to you that more than that, Enoch was no more. When they saw Enoch, when they heard Enoch, when they felt Enoch, when they experienced Enoch, they experienced God because he walked so closely with God. Beloved, have a walk worthy of of your calling. And what is your calling? To reach, listen to me, to reach the point of Christ's likeness where you reach the vanishing point, 
where he increases and you decrease. Where it's no longer your life, where your life is hid in Christ Jesus, where all they see is Christ. Oh, God, get me to that point, Lord. And everyone in my hearing, help us. Next week, we're going to talk about how we reach that vanishing point. How we maintain the unity, but at the same time, be encouraging the growth of the Christ likeness that should appear in every one of our lives. In every way, every week, every month, every year that Gail and I coexist as husband and wife, she should be seeing more and more and more of Jesus in my life. And I, in turn, should see more and more and more of Jesus in her life as we encourage one another and stir one another up and do the things that are necessary to maintain steadfastly apostles' doctrine, to be in prayer, to be in fellowship, to be in that communion where I'm confessing my sins, surrendering it to God, and allowing him to continue to change my life and my heart, to change me from the very core of my being, from the inside out. Not only does God love you far more than you will ever love him, how many really want to go to heaven and be with Jesus? Do you know that Jesus wants you there more than you want to be there? Yeah. Do you know that? He died so that you would be there. And it's absolutely certain. For those of us who are in Christ Jesus, those of us who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, our transport to heaven is absolutely certain. It's just a matter of when and how, right? That he desires us to be there where he is more than we desire to be there. It's an amazing truth, isn't it? How about you rest on that this week and begin to consider how your life can further go down that path like Enoch where you reach the vanishing point where it's no longer about you but it's all about him. Amen? Shall we stand?